need some inspiration before we get down there and start sanding out that wing. Anyway, time to get down to shop, get out the sandpaper, and let's start sanding. It's time to sand. Okay, first thing, I always want to do a test. Now I have two real thin coats and one that I just slopped on here. So there's really three coats of clear on here already, but give it a day or so between coats. And if you're in a rush, put it up by a heating vent, but I suggest it's a lot better to dry in a normal dry time rather than try to force dry it. What I'm looking for before I go any further is powder. As soon as you see powder, you know you're not going to have a problem sanding this out. In fact, that's all I'm going to do. And then I want to start doping the whole wing, the tissue and all. See, right now I'm just concerned with the areas that are solid wood and tissued. And that's about all the sanding needs to be done. Don't want to make, don't want to go through in any spots, don't want to make any more of a project out of this than it has to be. Most important part in this, most important part is always to radius all the edges. That's why I like sticky back sandpaper. 320 is fine. If you had some 400, it would be even okay. Because we're not really going to take a lot of material off. We're just taking the fuzz off here. Now, you wouldn't want to do this. See, a lot of people come in if you don't have a test. And they go take the, the, the wing and the outboard leading edge and sand right through the tissue. You need at least two or three coats, maybe even four of clear on this over the tissue. And obviously, that's what we've done in between videos is get those coats on and let them dry. But to make sure every one of these corners and edges is radiused, in fact, what I do is I re-put the bolts back in so it rounds out those edges just a little bit. But having these little parts for a test, if you see powder and you see no chewing gum on a sandpaper, you know you're ready to sand out the wing. Always use the little test parts, just my little trick. <laughs> the little test parts give you an indication of if the dope is dry enough. And if you let Brodac dope dry one day between coats, it, it almost every time is going to be perfect. Now, obviously, we'll slit those with a razor. This is where you can really make up some speed using Brodac dope, because what would happen is you're not wasting all that time waiting for everything to dry and get hard. Now, we got a little wrinkle in the tissue here. Again, I want to radius the edges. just being real careful. And I'm going to detail sand out the wing. Everything that's an edge. And once you put dope over that, that'll pretty much disappear. We double tissue it in here just to make it a little stronger. At times I've glassed that. That's even a good idea. But the main thing is getting all these edges. When guys appearance point to plane, they usually rub their hands on edges, is what they do. You know, they don't usually in there anybody can get that one right. It's the edges that are difficult. Anyway, you can see stuff is just powdering off, flaking off. So I have every confidence in the world that we'll get a couple of coats of clear on this today. And then what we can do, just let that dry a couple days. We have some commitments over this weekend. So if it's sitting out in the garage drying all weekend, wow. Time I get back to it Monday, that'll really, it should be hard as a rock. Now because this dope dried up so well, I, I can't tell you how nice this dried up. This is just unbelievable. I can remember times when I'd put dope on and let it sit over the weekend and it'd be chewing gum Monday morning. It'd really be frustrating, but all of the edges, actually I'm going to get out there. I wouldn't even bother putting this on video because it's, it's just redundant. I'll be able to get a coat on now, then i got to go over to the houses, come back, put another coat on, I'll probably be 
six, seven, eight hours later. But before I sand this again, I'll get three coats on the wing. Silk span, the whole thing, three coats. Roughly 50-50. If I see any humidity in the air, we'll spike it with a little retarder. I mean, the whole key here is that it's turning to wait, powder. See, that's what, when you have a quality material, a mil-spec thing, it's not made for a hobby. The whole key to having quality stuff is that it's not made for a hobbyist. Then they don't water it down and change it, and every batch is different. Again, the big trick, using your hands. I notice I'm not using a sanding block at this point because I don't want to... I've already made the shape. I'm really not going to have any luck changing the shape. And I don't... The, the other thing people do from time to time, they get from this point and they sand right through the tissue. Well, that isn't going to do much good either. I think we're ready to go out. Be raking leaves this weekend. Look at these leaves. Anyway, this is going to be a great day. Got the first coat on here. We'll get one on. Maybe six hours from now, get another one on. Anyway, boy, this stuff dries up beautiful. If you've never, if you've never used this, you're really in for a treat. I don't know. I love the the look and the. Uh, the autumn leaves, but boy, this is part of it I hate, and this is what we're going to do this weekend while the uh, the dope is drying. All right, in today's mail, I got some real interesting information. This is from a friend called Joel Chesler. Joel's out in California, and he had done some tests with using aero, uh, aero gloss, and I'm trying to make sure I, I don't put words in his mouth here, using aero gloss with Brodac dope to do a compatibility test with Brodac primer. He says, I decided to test its compatibility using Aerogloss and Brodac primer. The top coats are also Aerogloss, so there seems to be no problem using these two products. I have enclosed some photos, on, and the model is 18 and a half ounces, which, by the way, is pretty good. He also said he sent John Brodac a small test piece to use as uh, that he experimented with and that's something I suggested that he do so um, I really appreciate the other people Joel and all of the other people about well, there probably is 200 realistically that have contributed data into our Brodac dope finishing videos and what we're going to be doing in the, within this video probably we're going to be trying a couple of other things new for the first time and the more people that test and the more people that can give us feedback, the more we can help John with promoting and improving the product if it needs to be adjusted. Well, it's that time. We're going to go work on that Spitfire bedroom, see if we can get some of these planes mounted up there, move some of the furniture up there, and give you a little look at what's going on. Well, this is the beginning of, I guess last weekend we got the painting done. But I think this really came out real nice. Now Karen took the lead in, I don't know, laying this out. Now we're going to go picking out some, some memorabilia. I'm going to bring some things up from downstairs. Karen's going to be refinishing some furniture. Hey, so far, we don't even have a lamp in here yet. This is going to be the beginning of what I hope is going to be our Spitfire bedroom. And I think this is a fitting uh, way to store the Spitfire models. Anyway, now that we're into Mustangs, it's nice to know these will be just stored. Not get all dinged up downstairs where it's very humid. The heat is inconsistent. Up here, the heat is just like in a normal house. Anyway, just thought you'd enjoy a minute or two of this before we actually 
get rocking and rolling on that wing. I'm getting ready to sand that wing out. It's been sitting out there all weekend while we had Paul Winter here visiting us. So that dope should be dry and ready to go. Now one of the things we thought about doing, well, my really dear friend and I guess super friend George, one of the ideas we were thinking about doing is because we can take the ceiling here, we can paint some clouds and some some Messerschmitts or something. Anyway, if anybody's got any better ideas or some idea that uh, would be appropriate here. Actually, when you look at this, when I stand back in this room, this is, this is a big part of my life sitting up here. This is four years of building, four, four concourse awards, four top five fly-offs. but at Wendy's, the Spitfire bedroom. I love it. A lot of good memories up here. Boy, when you think of the last the last four years, the friendship with Joe Adamusco, we've just had the best of times. We've had probably the four best nationals we've ever had in a row. Most fun. Love that Spitfire wing. Woo -wee. Anyway, back to the shop. Then I'll come up here once a week and put a minute or two of tape as this room evolves into what we hope is going to be our ultimate guest bedroom. Next time John Brodak stays at the house, he won't have to stay in a room full of dolls. He can stay in a room full of Spitfires. Now with this area out, we're going to be building some benches or something. I don't know. We gotta. We just have too many things going on in too small of an area. Anybody that's ever tried to run a a business like this out of it's just stuff everywhere to tell you the truth. Anyway, it's nice to see those Spitfires on display in a place I think pretty relative to where they belong. Anyway, it's time to start looking at. This is dried now. It's ready to make that determination, critical determination that we always do with the small parts. If we can get it to powder off and what grit paper we're going to use. Now if it doesn't powder off, if it chewing gums off, we have a real easy thing. We'll just work on some other project for the next couple of days. Because we really have three coats on all the wood surfaces over and above the tissue and five coats on the tissue. And you can see just the slightest hint of a, a shine on there and that's about what you want. Now, just always having these little pieces to work with. This is so good. Now, one of the things, I know I've, this hair, this brush is really starting to lose hairs as we <laughs> maybe have to even buy. Heaven forbid I should have to buy a new one. I'm going to do my first thing with some sticky back 320. Kill all the edges before I get into the open bay part of this. Again, by now, it's really pointless to use a sanding block because... We, we're not going to be changing the shape. If we don't have the shape we want right now, we're basically screwed. Now the two things we're looking for is powder. No chewing gum and powder. And it looks like we're going to have it. Now see most of the hairs come right off. But the determination I want to make, I want to sand this whole thing out today. It's a horrendous day out there and this is the time of year. I like getting my cup of coffee going and have some friends come over and we start uh, cajoling about the world of model aviation. But I can sit around now. This is going to take me quite a while. See, there's one hair left in here. If you're seeing powder, you're sanding with random orbits. That's about how long it's going to be for every surface. And the main thing is get used to the idea if you see powder, you know that's pretty much ready to go. But it's really a choice that we have right now. Since we do have enough material on here. See, this is one of the things that I really like about Brodak Dope. I can get going right now. Now, if, if I did this and all of a sudden I see chewing gum, well, I, I have only one of two choices. I can use rougher paper 
or I can let it sit for a couple of days, in which case I'm just sitting in limbo land here. And I want to get this wing up to silver so I can start the fuselage, because the wing is going to plug right into the fuselage. It's, it's going to be impossible to really lay out the fuselage until the wing is done. But the thing here, again, so important, this material really, really powders off. Radius all the edges. I want to show, I hope I can show this on the close-up. If I can get, and I don't know that I can here, if I can get a smooth enough finish on this, I may be able to get away with going right to silver or just getting away with one coat of silver talc filler. I'll, I'll certainly give that a try on the small parts first, but the idea is to get to this point and be one coat away from the silver. The time you want to sand it is when you're really one coat away, so you don't want to have 20 coats on this and be sanding, and you know you have too much substrate. You want to be one coat away, so when you put the silver on here, you can see little dry spots, the next coat, uh, almost no dry spots, or whatever. and then you know you have that absolute minimum, minimum substrate, and you're not, you've not added any weight at all extra to the plane by doing it that way. Now see these little low spots, these little shiny spots right by the hair here? Well, it's just easier to do this than on, the, on, say, the flat of the wing or the flap. By the way, I don't give any concern to the brush hairs. I know a lot of people panic when they see brush hairs. Because if they sand out and they're buried in paint, it won't really matter. And if they stick up, they'll just jump right out as you sand. I'm looking, and I'm hoping I can get this on here. That you can just see, see, here's a little shiny spot right down here. So when you find that, it, it's nice having that sticky back paper to do this. This is 320. And it looks like we're going to be able to sand this whole guy out this afternoon. But because the weather's so horrendous, there's no way I'm going to take a chance on spraying this today. The next coat of dope that goes on here will get sprayed, and we're going to wait for one way or another. We're going to wait for a, a low humidity, less than hurricane day out there. Always nice to have these little spots to work, little parts to work on first. Because we're having this nice padded table really pays. Again, this is such nice material to work with. I try to keep the table padded for the whole time I'm doing this, this type of sand out, and constantly look to see if you're getting any chewing gum parts. Now where I'm really, really careful, because I don't have extra paint on these cap strip edges and w wherever tissue ends and wood begins, I want to be very, very careful, very careful. So I'm going to be just dusting these. And it's a good idea in this point to even switch over to 400 paper from 320 because you don't want to get, you don't want to sand on those edges real hard until we get some extra material on them. And what I usually do is with a pinstriping brush kit, and we'll do that later on camera, is any amount from five up, extra coats of dope around that edge. But for right now, I'll spend the rest of today, and it looks like it's going to be a short day anyway, just trying to rough out the wood on this, the wood parts, get this all sanded out. And again, it's coming off just beautifully. Now this is the part that really takes a lot of, well, more time than you think it does. What I'm trying to do is use 320 and 400, but be real careful getting around these bay edges. This is where it just takes a lot of time. And all I want to do is get rid of any, any little high spots, brush marks, imperfections. I don't want to press down on any of these edges yet until I get some of that extra dope on there. Notice that I'm avoiding, avoid the edges at all costs. Right now, you press down on one edge and boop, you'll be right through. Now, this also takes all the hairs out of the mix that 
Thanks to our squirrel, the squirrel hair brush is dying little by little. Anyway, we're gonna look into picking up a new squirrel hair brush. It lasted three years, so we paid uh, zero for it, so I guess we can get our money back. But anyway, Ed Gallagher did give that to me years ago, and it lasted three years. Maybe it's the way I'm, it's not made for doing lacquer. I don't really know. The hairs come right out, though. They don't, they sit right up. They float to the surface, of course. Anyway, it's because we have so many open bays, this is going to be time-consuming. We're only going to put a minute or two on tape. We may not even finish this today because I anticipate this is the normal day that... Uh, see, we have a bad habit in this family. We like to eat. And what I found out is if I don't shop, supper time comes and I wind up with uh, peanut butter and jelly or something. Anyway. That's about how long it takes to do, how long I do, a couple of days. You can get a little idea of what kind of amount, what that looks like. It's just got a little bit of a shine. Once it's sanded, you should see no high spots. Those first four bays are done. I'll just do the rest of the sanding off camera. you're going to get a little spot and here I just got one where I sanded through the tissue if you're sloppy like me now luckily this is on the bottom but I'm just taking some thin CA because what I want to do I want to seal that wood then take the dry end let that dry there's another spot here where I just I'm going through the tissue see down and any other spot you see that needs a little attention, needs a little dressing off. These little spots, I don't, don't never use kicker on them. Just let them dry out, sand them down. Now the last thing I do is I take some 4-0 steel wool. Make sure it's 4-0. And I'm just going to just lightly just take, because I want to clean these edges up. Now I've gone and sanded up to that edge and sanded up, but I've not sanded the edge. And I'll just let the steel wool just touch it. You don't want to press hard on that. You don't want to give it anything, anything like pressing down on it. You don't want to wear those edges out until we get some extra dope around the corners. There he is that we touched up. Once that CA kicks off, I can just, just burnish them. Don't sand back down because you know you have a little bit of a high spot there. But you don't want to have raw wood there. Now luckily we only had two of them. Normally when I'm doing this, I have a lot more than two. Maybe I'm getting some job skills going here. Anyway, never say that on camera. Anyway, got some 4-0 steel wool. Any hardware store will have this. It's cheap as can be. Cheap as cornflakes. But make sure it's 4-0 because 3-0, 2-0, and 0 may scratch. 4-0, you want to just... Let me make sure I'm not hitting it. Start at one end and just very lightly I'll do one panel here. See how quickly this picks up the residue. And then we're going to be ready to put a little bit of extra dope around the cap strips and the lines. And no more than that. Just, just, you can do it with your hand. You can get a feel for where it's, that's probably plenty. Now steel wool is just like sandpaper. It's going to remove material. So you don't want to go crazy. It is good on doing compound surfaces and it's real good on doing tissue. But you can get carried away too. And you can get the edges raw. So I would guess just what you see in here is plenty. And that should get the surface ready for our... We're going to do the little edges of this next. And again, your hand is what tells you. This is, people look at it, until we get this in silver, you really can't tell by looking. The silver lets you do it by looking. Now the whole trick here is, I want to put a thin, and I took the material that we used right out of the can, just put it in a smaller jar. 
You might a trick if you're if you're working in incandescent light instead of fluorescent. You might want to put a drop of to a silver or some other color in here. But basically, I just want to all the edges. I want to give this maybe four or five coats. And what this does, when you're doing your sanding and buffing and everything, it just gives you that little insurance policy that you're not going to... This is where it's going to rip. I've done this for about, oh my God, since Harold Price was alive. This was a Harold Price trick. I want to go around each open bay like this. A little striping brush. It adds absolutely no weight. And actually what's happened is, and it's it's a shame, is we've had another terrible session of weather. We, we're actually waiting for a hurricane to get here or something. Trees are blowing around. So this will be a good day. I'll get at least five coats on. Give it an hour or so to dry. Flip it over to the other side. It's, it's usually dry relatively quickly. Another nice feature of Brodak dope. Anyway, if you want to... Here, let's take a look at this. You can kind of see how that works out. Now obviously what we're going to do, we're going to do each open bay. Wait maybe 10 minutes, flip it over, do the other side. Well, that's dry and I can mix up the silver and do a little test on the flaps. So I'll be all set to, uh, maybe even today. I doubt it though. It, this is the point, I don't want to rush. I'd like to let this dry a while or at least a couple hours. And because we have the heat on in the house, I can put this up by a heating vent. It'll probably dry relatively quickly. The flaps pretty much sanded out, ready to go. I just need to mix up some Brodak silver here. Again, I'm trying not to ever paint in the house, or as little as possible. But every once in a while, I try to get, uh, you know, I just need to get something going, and then I can get it out in the garage drying. Now, right there is the magic formula for success. Brodak dope and a strong cup of coffee. We're going to stay up tonight. We're going to finish this no matter what. I want to get as many coats on as possible, and tomorrow we should be ready to do some spraying of silver. Now last year we did a little experiment. I think it worked pretty well. Is what we did, normally at this point in time you would take talc and clear and mix up thinner. And problem with that is even if you put a little bit of blue or red or something in it, you can never really see it. So what we did, and we did it on the Brodak Dope video set, we mixed up what I call silver talc filler. And what I'm going to try this year, I'm going to spray this right over the silk span and everything and see if it works. Again, I always like to experiment on my own plane. If it doesn't work, obviously we'll sand it off. Leave this on the video because this is something that happened about a year ago. Well, maybe more. I was doing some Brodak dope testing in a coffee can and I forgot to take out the last little bit of coffee. And Here I am spraying and seeing all these little brown spots and everything. I say, what the hell is going on here? Brodak must have got mosquitoes in this paint. And I looked and I'm sure, all at the bottom there was about a spoonful of coffee. Well, now I clean the cans with thinner. That's step one. Again, what I'm going to do tonight, I call staging. Because it's late tonight, I'm really not going to be able to paint today. But I can get all the paint mixed, all the things ready for the next day. And that's a significant advantage. Now, because I'm going to make up some some talc filler and this worked out so I gotta tell you this worked out so well on that Spitfire well the way you can tell if it works well if when you sand it it doesn't turn to chewing gum and if that happens well then you're you know you're probably <laughs> probably in pretty good shape anyway I want to show this on the tape now one of the things I used to do years ago if I knew I was going to use a product about two days before I'd turn it upside down and all the stuff would be on the top. Well, you know, showing you that I've learned over the years and that old age is setting in. I didn't do that, but I always take something and oh, I don't want to do it what you see with any silver, any metallic really, is it all sinks to the bottom. So the first step is to stir the hell out of it.
And this is the part a lot of people, when, they, when they're doing anything with silver, they, they don't really stir it enough. And so it doesn't cover as well as it should. What we're looking to do is put a coat of filler on, silver filler, that when we, it'll, number one, it'll show all the mistakes. And if it's perfect, we just sand it down and we're done. We can paint some silver, just lay a coat on with no talc. So I only want to mix about half of this up. I want half with the talc, and I can mix half without the talc. But the first step, obviously, is going to be dump this out. And you see old blobs and everything coming out of there. Okay, that's what's at the bottom. Now, to get the rest out of the bottom conveniently, some good old-fashioned Brodac thinner. And by the way, if you've never used Brodac thinner before, you're, you're probably the first thing you're going to say is, oh, gee, I can use up some old thinner that I bought in a hardware store. Don't even think about it. In fact, if you're thinking that way, buy one less salami sandwich and you'll win on both ends. You'll be as skinny and good looking like me. <clears throat> you can tell I've been eating a lot of salami sandwiches. If you follow this formula, I wanted this on the tape because we're going to be referring to Brodak Silver Filler over and over. Now, he's got white primer. The white primer is, has applications, but not for us right now. When we do other things, we're going to be using that. But certainly, I don't feel it's an appropriate choice to go over silk span or it's, it's perfect for other uses, maybe on foam wings. I haven't tried it on that, but th there's certainly things it's ready for. Now, what I call staging is getting everything ready so tomorrow morning, so while it's nice and wa warm out, it's probably going to be 30 degrees, I'll have everything mixed and ready to go. Now what this does, this tells me that I have a 50, a roughly 50-50 mix of thinner. Notice how it just fits in a coffee can. There's a little bit left in the bottom. Well, I always think a little bit of extra doesn't hurt. A little extra thinner never hurt anybody, that's for sure. But I want to get all that material off the bottom. Because from this point on, we're looking to put on a micro-thin coat with as good a coverage as possible. A lot of people never even pour off the bottom of the material. Well, you know, you can guess what that's going to do. And it wouldn't matter if this was colored dope or what. Any material. This pretty much gives you a real close 50-50 mix. Now, if you think your hands are dirty, and mine are, from, from working in machinery, on machinery a lot, you might want to put a drop of fish eye killer in there. That certainly wouldn't hurt. But now the magic trick. We want to pour off. Every time I do this, I think of a little bit better way of doing it. I'm going to get that mixed up. So we know we have like 52% thinner here. I want to put half of it back in the can because this allows me to custom blend it later on. You get an idea what the consistency is. Okay, we can put that away now. That's going to be our blend. Now, it doesn't matter at this point in time how much talc you put in here. It, it's an inconsequential thing because all you care about is what's going to stay in suspension. Look at this. I can't even open the top. Here we go. It doesn't matter. You can be, and, and the cheapest talc you can buy. You don't have to go buy an, you know, $10 a, a jar talc. But you do have to answer the phone if you want to stay in business. Let me get the phone. My President Nixon just really loves calling me. But anyway, you've got to get this stirred in well, shaken up. This has the talc in it. Any amount. Now what you do is you let it sit for five minutes. Look at your watch. Five minutes later, you pour this off into a jar, and whatever stays at the bottom is your overage. So you always have the right amount of talc in that mix. That's the best trick going. Now what that is, that's fish eye killer. And because my hands, you see how magic that is? You put one drop in every batch. That kills all the surface tension. Let's the paint flow out a little bit smoother. One or two drops for any batch you make, especially the filler. Okay, now what we're going to do, five minutes from now, pour this into a spray gun. And then we know we have enough talc in that mix. 
and tomorrow we'll be ready to paint. Now before I finish up here tonight, I want to mark the th mark the container so I know what's in there and I know the other one is just silver dope, a little bit more thinner than paint. And tomorrow we'll see how the weather is. Now the last thing I'll do tonight is I'll get another coat. Five coats is usually enough. Get five coats on this whole thing and tomorrow we'll be ready to start spraying our filler. Let's hope for some good weather. Now I'm glad I got that stuff all staged up. It's, we've been blessed with a low humidity day but the wind is howling out here. I'll tell you one great idea that I've come up with many times. When you're going to start a new plane, and this has some, well, I don't even know what this is in here. Whoever was using this gun last, I have to blame somebody. I can't take the blame. Always run some thinner. Now, everybody's always crying the blues about how expensive thinner is. Well, this is a good place to use up your old thinner, the stuff that's 100 years old. All these old off-brands you've been saving all your life. Well, look at the junk that comes out of here. I've let this sit. Even letting it sit, it's not softening up. There's some real crap in there. It's gold. I got gold, I got black, I got everything in here. Yeah, there's still some in there. But always start with a clean gun. That's, if you start with a gun that's got some goop in it, it contaminates the whole project. Now what I do, the thinner that you use, once you get the big stuff out of here, another good trick is put it in a jar like this, let it sit for, who knows, a week or so. All the stuff will fit, get to the bottom and you can just gently pour that off. So in effect, you're not throwing the thinner away. And I know uh, the people in our economy-minded hobby just love that tip. Now see, this will get a lot of the goop out of there. And I can use that thinner over and over again to clean. Look at this, still stuff in here. Wow. Here I am trying to convince people you got to clean the gun. Now when I'm all done with this, I'll put some real clean thinner in here. It's a good way to use up all your old off-brand thinner, by the way. Just spray some clear thinner through here. Maybe a third of a container of it. Look at the stuff coming out of here. Wow. Still, so, it's hard to believe. Doing this on video. You think I would be, have enough sense to go back and erase the tape? Well, we're going to shake this up. This always works. Famous last words. But this is one of the key things to doing a real nice finish. You got it. There's some basics. It's like ABCs that... Another thing, too, if you have a filler gun, a gun if you have the luxury, and we we don't really have one, but this is our oldest gun. Use the oldest gun you have for the filler, because you don't care. You're going to sand it out anyway. All right, that looks pretty good. We're ready. <laughs> I really hope we're going to be able to paint out here. It is really blowing away, and it is cold. Woo! And believe me, this is this is macho painting when you can paint in this weather. My hands are freezing. It isn't it isn't really funny, but the other night Karen by mistake locked the garage and locked me in there for and I was in a t-shirt. And then realized, where's Wendy? Comes out and gets me. Look at this, the camera's gonna blow over. Anyway, the thing I wanted to show, the filler goes on just a little bit dry. But that's the kind of coverage I'm looking for. Yeah, it still has a little shine to it. You always want to do your little test parts first. Looks like we have the mix about right here. As if cold wasn't enough. <laughs> the gun gets so cold you can oddly turn it. Anyway, there's very little talc. After you let it decant for five minutes, there's very little talc, but there's just enough that when we sand this off, it'll impart a really nice surface. Now, if this comes out stone dull and it looks like auto primer, then you know you have too much talc. You should wait a little more, maybe wait six or seven minutes to let it all sink to the bottom. But the silver filler to me this way, well, every plane I've ever done this way has resulted in a concourse award, so I kind of like this way. One of the hard parts to paint here is always a flap. I always put a little wire on it. I start at one end, get the edges done. It is cold out here. <laughs> You better believe, when Karen rescued me from the garage, I was not in a real good mood. And of course she rubs it in. She was calling me blue lips and things. Well, winter is here. 
You won't see any more, I don't think, any more flying sessions on video. Anyway, I'm going to do one flap. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do the wing out here. In fact, I'm going to do the wing in a hole and just clutch, shut the door behind me. It is, it's impossible to do a wing out here. You wind up putting your finger through it or something. I noticed that the thing I wanted to show is that I'm getting on a thin coat. I'm not getting on a big, thick, auto primer kind of coat. And we're definitely going to be sanding this off. This is not going to stay on here. All this coat is doing is showing me where I need filler, where my scratches are, imperfections, whatever. I really hate to paint in the house, but today is going to be... Luckily, Karen won't be home till late tonight, and I'll leave the fans going. But it, there's a point at which you just can't paint. And I think we're at it right now. Maybe <laughs> we were at it the other day, too. Okay, I see a dry spot already. Now, when I get to the end, I put my thumb on the end of the wing and just paint your thumb silver. This coat obviously gets sanded off. Now, what I do is get one side painted like this when I'm in the house and I got to rush to do this. And then I go over all the ribs, all the cap strips, all of those edges, an extra coat. Everywhere there's an edge. Also look for dry spots. There's a dry spot there. A little one there. Usually the leading edge will be dry. Little sand food spots. Now the trick is to get this out in the garage because it'll gas off real nice out in the garage. And then tonight, just before I go to sleep, I'll bring it in and put it by a heating vent. But these first couple of hours, It'll dry up real slow. It'll it will result in the paint laying down real nice. And maybe tomorrow or so we can get this wet sanded out. Looking for dry spots. See right around here there's a dry spot. And it's always a good idea to give all the cap strips, all the edges extra. I know around the front of the leading edge there'll be a dry spot right there. I'll let this dry about 15 minutes. Just go back, give it a second coat, and put it out in the garage to dry. Actually, you can see all the silk span is really dry. I ought to give all the silk span a second coat. Anyway, it's really, it's really cold out there. And the trick is, if you're ever going to paint indoors, of course, get a big fan going. Wear a good Wilson mask, needless to say. Now, people think I don't wear a mask, but I do. I just don't like to do video with it on. leave the fans on, you know, basically until Karen comes home, but you really want to get as much air circulation if you have to paint inside. It's real important and you always want to wear one of those good Wilson masks. Now we'll let this dry out here, but tonight we're going to put this in by the heating vent. Now, if you didn't have a, a, a health problem, yeah, it would be nice to put this by the heating vent right now, but uh, in our case, we leave it out by the garage. We get all my little test pieces going out here. Now, usually I've noticed under the shop conditions out here, usually about four hours, four to six hours after I paint, this stuff is, yeah, 90% of the smell is gone. So, anyway, oh, but it's cold. Woo Swirling and leaves blowing out here. Oh, man. Funny getting locked in here last night. Karen did. She came in said, oh, gee, Wendy's in there. And once that's done, I had no way to get out of the garage until she came and rescued me. Now, in today's mail, every year, right around this time, because I'm on their mailing list, I guess. <clears throat> not, not that I buy a lot of aviation-related things, but... Anyway, they always give the little preview of the Ghost 2000 calendar, and this is really a nice thing to have in your shop. We have one in our shop, of course. In fact, we have two of them. 
and people over the years have uh, sent me old ones that uh, hey we don't care about the dates it's the planes we're interested in look at this and I think if you were interested in a uh, p47 type of paint job this is a I guess it doesn't get much more colorful than Tar Heel Dan well you know one of the things I did last year I guess I wrote a letter to this company. I said, why don't you make a calendar with all Reno Air Racers? I'll buy that one, and I'm sure a lot of other people will. Well, maybe they're going to come out with it. I don't know. Anyway, they just have a spectacular amount of stuff. I'll put the, the ordering information up on the screen here in a second. Great stuff. Everybody needs a calendar, and boy, you sure don't want to have one of these, you know, a calendar from your local pharmacy or something in your shop. Check this out. This year they even have CDs. Now here's a CD. If anybody wants to buy Al Rabe a nice birthday present, here's a Bearcat CD. Check flight on a P38. Want to hear two Merlins running at once? See, this is the kind of stuff. If if somebody turns you on to it, and you get on their mailing list, hey, you'll have you'll have it every year. They never take you off the mailing list. Trust me. You have enough of these in your shop, and you'll be wanting to build a warbird. A warbird. You'll be like Gerald Champ sitting there drooling over warbirds like I am, man. <laughs> Awful lot of cool stuff. Hey, Spitfires. Anyway, if warbirds turn you on, hey, it's a good source of inspiration. But that's a nice picture right there. Ooh, that's nice. Anyway, here's the information. It's an 800 number. Call them up. You get a free little booklet like this, and you can order up all your all your Christmas presents for your aviation uh, type friends. Just like Pro Stunt products, their catalog is free. They'd love to get you on a mailing list. Now, what we did since the last time we shot video, we took an extra day and let this silver dry out. It's been so cold outside, and I figure an extra day up by the heating vent wouldn't hurt. But I needed to do some reorganization, as you probably know. We don't have a machine shop in South Jersey anymore, but we have all the equipment that was in that machine shop located in what used to be Ken Thompson's old foam wing shop. And we haven't, I haven't shot any video over there because it's been so cold, and the work moving machinery has been so labor-intensive. But what we did, this used to be where we had our plane rack, we now moved our carbon fiber bench over there. And what we have here, it just gives us a little more breathing room, a little more room to get our Brodac dope in order here, since we're going to be ready to start doing some intense sanding this afternoon. Once I get back from the post office, we're going to sand this guy out. That extra day sitting up by the heating vent always helps. Now, because I let this dry an extra day, what I wanted to try is, I want to see how much of this I can buff out with the 4-0 steel wool. Now, there's a couple of advantages. See, you got a trade-off here. If you use Sickens M600 and 600, 500, or 1200 paper, what happens is you have a lot of M600 you spray in and everything. So I was looking for some a little bit, well, less odiferous uh, way of doing it for Karen's sake. And so, what I was going to try to do, because this is filler coat now, and it's not really the final coat of silver, I'm going to have to put another coat of silver on. I wanted to try doing the whole thing with 4-0 steel wool. Now, it seems like it doesn't go as fast as sandpaper, but there's certainly a factor of there's two things you're trading away. There's no smell in the house, which Karen really appreciates. The other thing you trade away is and there's, there's no stuff on your hands at the end of the day. Although, if you have office worker hands, you're going to have a lot of little steel splinters. Maybe you could even use rubber gloves, I don't know. Sometimes it's just better to get the calluses and get it over with. Anyway, you can get a little, I'll do some of this on a close-up, see how quick this, almost like, and you got to constantly be moving the pad, almost like buffing it out. Goes kind of quick. And what happens about this time of year, you start building up those arm muscles. It's like jogging. All of a sudden, a sand out like this is not a big deal. And you can see how, just to give you an idea. Now, the other thing is there's a lot of dust, so you might want to, in fact, I may get a, one of those little, those little doctor masks would be a good idea to avoid breathing this in. How quickly that can, 
and it leaves it imparts a nice a relatively nice surface on there but these are nice these flaps turned out real nice killers you don't want to like washing a car you keep on rolling it and keep using a different part of it I've tried a couple I've done this before and I've been ah eh, well it's six of one half a dozen of another the M600 there's advantages disadvantages but right now I'm trying to use as little M600 as I possibly can. Again, it's because Karen is physically in the house right now. But again, it gives me a chance to experiment, maybe come up with something that we can use. And because Brodak dope goes into that state of hardness relatively quickly. Now you notice I'm taking every, almost everything off. I'm just leaving the slightest hint of that filler on there. There's only filler in the very little, little there you can see it right now you can see how much is in there not much at all I think maybe one one or at worst two more coats of filler and we'll be ready anyway I'll finish up the flaps and we'll take a look at how long it's going to take to do that wing and these little parts you just just polish right up almost like just like wax in a car really the steel wool seems to go well at least, you know, each time we do this, we try to do it a little bit differently so that we can learn and see what all the choices are. Seems seems to be the only downside of it is all the dust from the steel wool, so I've been vacuuming up every time I, I get it about to this point. Okay, once I have a nice big cup of coffee, we get started on these open bays and on this wing. I hope I can get this all done in one session. this I know we have extra coats around all the edges I want to make a decision how I'm going to do this if I'm going to use steel wool or sandpaper so what I'll try to do is just get one bay let's see how long it takes to do one bay sometimes if the paint is really soft the steel wool because we have three or four coats extra around all the open bay areas so we may wind up using one of two things, we can either use M600 and steel wool. And see, this is what you want to do. You want to have all these choices. If the paint is really nice and dry, you probably can just use steel wool dry. But what happens if the paint is still a little soft when you put four coats on and now well, three or four coats. All right, I want to try this. What I'm going to try is, this looks like it's going to be a little bit too soft. Let's try. Next thing, let's try steel wool wet. Steel wool wet is good. This is M600. You can try Windex, soapy water. Let's see if this is going to cut. What we're looking for is a cut. When material is soft and it doesn't want to cut, you usually have to go up and grit or sand it wet. And I don't like sanding with water around the wood, if at all possible. The nice thing about the M600, it doesn't swell the wood. Now what this is looking like is possibly, we're going to go to some 600 sandpaper here for the open bay part. Yeah, this is just taking a little bit longer than I would like to. So let me tear off a piece of 600. Let's see how long it's going to take to do a bay with 600. I'll just pick the next bay, a new bay, since we're just doing an experiment here. What I'm looking for is to see how quickly this material is going to cut. It looks like the appropriate choice here is going to be 600 sandpaper and M600 for the open bays. Yeah, it's cutting a lot quicker than a steel wool. The choice is, it's common sense. You don't want to not sand it. You leave it on all the weight. And you don't want to sand it all off. If you sand it all off, well, what was not much point in putting it on, other than if you need the exercise. 
But what, I, what I'm saying is you kind of have to figure the right spot at which to stop on an open bay is when you can just see the silver around the edges, and it looks like we're almost at that point now. But as soon as you see a hard white spot, then you know you have to quit. Once you get beyond that, let me show this up close. Here's the problem. If you get much deeper than this, you're going to wind up cutting the edge of the silk span. And this is why we put that extra material around the edges and why I sprayed, I think, three coats of extra silver. But what it's going to do is I want to get, as this is probably about what I'm looking for, but I want to get into these corners and edges as much as I can. This bay here, and you saw how much time it took to do that, and all I need to do is do that 150 more times than I have it. But, but I'll do the open bays first just to get an idea. That's about how much material I want to leave on here when I'm all done, and I don't want to go through the edges if I can help it. Now, another little tip, and I mean, I mean, these are the little things that you need to know. You, when you say again, when you see an area like this, you know you've got to quit. That's it until we get another coat on here. You know, it's always going to be difficult to get in the corners, so I just really just take your time, take your time, take your time. It's going to be time consuming. And no matter what, one thing that always will pay, always, whenever you're using Sickens M600, or actually any dope product, actually anything with a solvent in it, keep a little fan going. Now, usually I have this fan off camera, but because I'm, Karen's in the house here, I'm trying to get the back door open and get this place vented as much as possible. Anyway, now from this point on, it's just time consuming. I doubt we're going to finish this in one session. But that's the whole point, is I want, to, I want it to be perfect. We're not having a race. We're not having a race to see if we can finish it this afternoon. It's so cold outside. Even if the plane were buffed out, we couldn't even test run the engine. So I'm going to try to get my coffee going, relax, maybe get half of it done. Half would be pretty realistic. But detail the corners and always use your hand as the guide for when it's done. And remember, you never want to sand it all off, and you never want to leave it all on. But knowing, when you can figure out that it should look just about like this, and this is these extra coats of paint up here, as soon as you go through on an edge, you're done. And when that, all the clear is buffed out, all these corners will kind of be buried. And that's what gives it that if you look at a plane, it's all buffed out, and you look down a wing and you see all those little light reflections, you're not going to see a razor-sharp edge. Knowing how much to leave on and how much to take off. It's the whole the whole thing that makes this, that you could get this information. I don't know how else you could get this information other than off a of video. You, or maybe a really good quality picture. And it's that fine balance, as I'm going through this, the fine balance of trying to get just enough off. And boy, if you've ever, if you've never done this, what happens is you get sick the day you do this. You look at the, oh, it looks so nice until I painted it silver. Well, the silver is there for a reason. It helps you find all the little flaws and mistakes. And ultimately, that's one of the reasons that I prefer the silver anyway over some other color, the light blue or the gray or whatever. This really, really finds every little flaw. I'm trying to show this at various stages of, still have to do the leading edge. Worked on the tips for a while. And to me, it's just time consuming. It's time for an extra cup of coffee. See how much of this we can get done today. This is the, sp the spray container that I use. If you use Windex, a Windex container, it usually lasts uh, a very short amount of time and the seal goes bad. But you can always get one of these from Consolidated. They're about two or three dollars and this one I've had for three or four years already. Hey, the part number is 41789. These people ship out same day. Real good to do business with. Sake, everything starts looking like the Tin Man. Now, you, I didn't know if I was going to get finished today. Due to the fact that I'm a well-conditioned athlete, I've been picking away at this 
I've got about 90% of it done, and what I decided to do is just finish it today and be done with it. I saw it on the window. You like that frog on the window? It's a nice froggy. Yeah. I put a, I put a toy frog on Karen's window. She comes in, opens the window. Ah! Anyway. I've been going like a crazy man. I'm trying to finish this up. And what I'm going to try to do tonight... Is a, is a little bit of staging because tomorrow is supposed to be what I hope is going to be a low humidity day and if I can stage this out right what I can do is get my next coat of silver on and this looks good enough with one coat of filler but normally I need two or three coats I put as many as four or five on too but this looks good enough that what I'm going to do I'm going to try to go with the one coat of filler and just mix up some silver in fact I'll mix it up tonight it's that thing I talked about staging so that tomorrow morning, as soon as Karen goes to work, I can paint. And by the time she gets back, the house won't be so smelly. Anyway, look what this does to the table, too. And your hands and everything. Anyway, everything is like the Tin Man here. These corners and edges that really take the time, but... You know, I've, uh, in my life, the only way I've ever really gotten the things I wanted out of life was I had to tough it out and tonight's one of those nights I'm gonna tough this out finish both sides of this hopefully get another coat of silver on tomorrow I'm even this is the part that really takes time is all the detailing of the edges and the corners between the old the, the, the solid wood part goes relatively quickly like when you're doing a foam wing it goes very quickly Anyway, again, the trick is to know just exactly how much to leave on. And and when you get into that point, like right here, where it's really getting thin, you know you have to quit. Another low spot right here. But after, after we put silver on this, a real coat of silver with no talc in it, sand it out with another, maybe even with 1,200, this will be, be ready to go. Everything done is to get some clean steel wool, and I'm just going to burnish this right off. In fact, what I like to do, I'm even going to mix the paint. Now, the next coat of silver, obviously, will have no talc in it. And what I'm going to do is decant it a little bit. What that means is let the pigment all sit to the bottom, pour a little bit off the top, so that, in, in essence, we have a little more than standard pigment. And I'll put just a little bit of retorter in it, so it'll tend to dry a little slower and smoother. We've gotten good use out of this table today, but you can see, I mean, this is going in the laundry soon. That table is shot. And as always, it's always your hands that tell you where the imperfections are. You want to always watch around those cap strip edges. Now, I'm being real careful not to go through on the edges. As soon as you see that light wood color coming through, you know you've got to quit. You know you're at the end of it. Anyway, we're excited about this weekend even getting some more work done on this Spitfire bedroom. And the other room, get the basic, get it cleaned up. We hope someday we'll be able to make an old gauge railroad there, but time and money have to control these decisions. Not just what I want to do. Right now, I'd like to get the final, I want to get everything ready for tomorrow, because boy, we have just really had the worst of weather this last week or two. And always let your, think there's another one.
And it really is a good idea to wear one of those little masks when you use this steel wool. This steel wool is, oh, okay, it's just, it puts dust in the air and everything. Really messy stuff, but it does a good job. All right, this should be ready for tomorrow. Paint's mixed and we're ready to go. Just need a nice, we're going to start early in the morning. And by the way, that's a good way if you need to get the smell out of the house. Hang it in the garage for four or five hours and bring it in and put it by a heating vent. Now in today's mail, this is from Mark McLaughlin. Read the little note. Stalker 46, 56 inch wingspan, modified Gerke Novi 4, Pro Stunt Controls, Uniflow. Unflown at this time. Tango Red. Mark's watched a lot of videos. It looks like it's starting to show in his. Well, one thing I love here, Mark, I have to tell you Novi, nothing. That's a Spitfire wing. That is. That is one nice uh, how anybody can not like <laughs> elliptical wings anyway from Mark McLaughlin tomorrow we're gonna paint silver I can't wait now we're up we're up you can hear the birds in the background one of the one of the things by staging everything the night before I get a real early start and this paint will get to dry in the warmest part of the day out in the garage which is a big help to Karen. Now, putting a coat of silver on that may or may not get sanded off, I have the extra pigment in here. I've decanted off the top. I've put a little retarder. I just want to play it safe because I don't really know the humidity until I do a test. But the other thing a lot of people do is they'll be, in the course of a day, they'll be painting silver and they, they don't shake the cap the cup enough. So with all that extra pigment in there, now I've got the pressure down to 20 PSI. I want to get on the lightest possible coat. I just want to get this dialed in. Just the lightest, just a coverage coat. Because I'm hoping this might be, and if it isn't, the last coat of silver. I can sand this off very quickly. This is just to show me the mistakes, and if it's flawless, then we can go on to the next step. And what I want to get is, the thinnest, lightest coat I can get on here. I just want to see where the flaws are. Anytime you make the mixture thinner, you can use less pressure. Anytime the mixture is thicker, obviously you need more pressure. That's, that's about the thinnest coat I can imagine we can get on there under these conditions. Always do a little test first. Always candle it to see that you have smooth, even coverage. We'll do all our little parts and then shoot that wing. Actually, there's no wind out here right now at all, but it's real early in the morning. The breeze is already coming up. At, I don't know if we're going to be really beating the system here or not. The sun is already coming up. Remember, what we're trying to get on here is one, thin as possible, but to cover all the grain, all little imperfections. Some people call this a blocker coat. When you use real low pressure like this, you have to be careful that you don't put it on so dry that in essence what you wind up with is when you pull a tape up, you pull a paint up. Pulling a paint up when you pull a tape up, almost always is a result of not having enough thinner in the paint, putting on coats too dry or with too much pressure. I notice that I'm really babying this along, and I want to try to hurry up before the wind comes up to do that wing. Boy, is it murder doing that wing when the, when the wind is blowing. But if it does come up, it's early enough in the day that I can get this painted out in that little hallway. Again, I try to leave, see if I didn't stage things the night before, or if I didn't stay up and finish this, now today I'm, this won't be going until, you know, the middle of the afternoon. And then when Karen gets home, it's not dry yet, it stinks up the house. When you're painting with low pressure like this, you just have to be very patient. 
And this really gets on a really... I don't think you can get it on any thinner than this, really. I can see a spot there where we went just a little bit through. In fact, let's show this up here. And see if you can see the little hairs coming through on a silk span. See those little hairs? That's from sanding it too thin. You can bet the wind is already up. Boy. You just can't get up early enough around here to get this stuff done. Anyway. The silver really picks up the flaws. Now, as I put the, the flaps into the garage, I noticed spots I had never seen yesterday, even in sanding it out. Okay, now here's a problem you may or may not have. Let me show this up close. I don't know if you can see this. See the little fish eyes in the paint? Now what I'm going to do is just add a little more fish eye killer to this mix. What that is is from yesterday, you know, all the contamination and sitting on that table full of M600 and steel wool and everything. So a little extra fish eye killer will usually cure that. It's good that we had this. And isn't, you don't touch it, you don't wipe it, nothing. Just put the fish eye killer in the paint. And that happens from the contamination of normally sanding or working on anything. Did just let it kick off and dry a little bit. I put a little fish eye killer in the paint, of course. Now I don't know. In my case, my hands are always oily and greasy from working on that other machinery and things down at the real shop. And once that, that dried five minutes, I just go right over the bad spot. That'll take care of it once and for all. You don't even have to deal with it. But if you go back and try to wipe it or sand it or do something to it, nah, it'll make you crazy. Now I can see I've gone through on a lot of the rib caps, which is just typical. And what I'm doing, when I get to the end of this panel, I'll go back around, go over the cap strips again. That's, that's what I really was trying to do, is get that minimum thin coat on. At least the wind isn't blowing too bad now. idea what that's going to look like when it's drying up. Okay, I hope that tip with the, uh, well, we didn't plan it that way, but that little thing with the fish eye killer, that's something that mystifies a lot of people, and unless you have real clean hands and you scrub under your fingernails or anything, you're almost bound to get that from time to time. Now, as always, this will sit out here for four to six hours, and then we can bring it in the house and put it by heating vent. The staging worked well, the fish eye killer even better, and we looks like we beat the wind to some degree. Still blowing around out there. Look at the jaws blowing shut. What we'll do, you see this? This is the sheet we used. This is going into the laundry, and I'll wash this before Karen even gets home. But it's all that silver dust and gloop, in fact, that goes right down into the sheet underneath it. Before we bring that wing in here, we're going to get rid of this dirty sheet, since we know this is one of the ones that caused the fish eyes. Just dump it in a wash, and in the meantime, we have another one. That's another good tip. Now, even though these sheets are out of the laundry, they still have the stain, but they, they do have all of the junk that usually would cause fish eyes out of them. Now today, Dennis Toth stopped by this afternoon, gave me this nice picture. And by the way, he had a guy, he had a little caption for it. This was the concourse winner in Wayne Triven's event, and obviously the concourse winner in uh, in Precision Aerobatics. 
kind of cool. Looks like <laughs> looks like the plane had a baby here or something. Anyway, nice photo. I'll put this up by my desk. This is a good one. Anyway, I see we have, and I'm dying to share this with you. I see we have a nice a nice photo pack from Buzz Perica, who, by the way, is a professional photographer. Now, this is Buzz's Nobler. And believe me, believe me, Buzz worked on this, and I got this long, tear-jerking letter. He worked on this for four years. He watched hundreds of windy videos. Yada, 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 yada. You notice he has a blanket just like I have. He finally gets the thing done. And it's a beauty, obviously. It really does look nice. Green box nobler. Gets it all done after four years of, of hard work. I know you're going to know the end of this story when I tell you. He goes out to the flying field. Yeah, it's a little breezy, but... Ah, Wendy said it's okay to fly it. So he tries to blame me. He goes out there, gets it all fired up, gets a couple of test flights. And then you know what's going to happen. He says he... Lost a little line tension above 45. Backed up. Well, Buzz, we all know we're all too old to back up by now. And as he was backing up, had a little boop de boop. Well, anyway, I know you're going to fix it, Buzz, and I know you're going to do a little. Because you're a professional photographer, and by the way, Buzz contributed that 62 Nats video graciously. Look at a pilot. He's even got a pilot in there. Anyway, and he's contributed a nice set of photos here. We'll pass some of these on to Stunt News. And in fact, we're going to keep a couple and hang them up in the shop here. This is one of the planes that, uh, well, I think it has it, it has a little part in the history of our shop anyway. Because Buzz has all those videos. Looks like they didn't hurt you, though. Now you can get some kind of an idea here. When you see this kind of humidity, obviously we know we're not going to be able to paint any today. So we're just going to let that sit up by the heating vent for another day. Hope that we can come back to a little bit sunnier day tomorrow. And if not, we'll let it sit for the whole weekend and work on a Spitfire bedroom. But this is the kind of weather you never want to even consider putting a coat of paint on. All the retarder in the world isn't going to make this go away. Okay, now this is dried over the weekend. Actually, the, the extra day or so of drying is a big help. We've had a, nothing but bad, rainy, clammy weather. And I want to I wanna really make sure I detail this well. You see the dry spots? See this spot right over here? It's drier than where it normally has enough, like there's enough up here. Well, you can kind of figure out what we're going to need is another coat on this. But first, we'll sand this coat off with 1,200. And by doing that, yeah, it's an extra day or two of sanding, but what we'll have is a lighter, better coat with no dry spots at all when we're done. Now this piece looks like it might be real close to having the right amount on, but because we're going to sand it, we'll wet sand it with M600, we'll do the whole thing, get another coat on the whole thing. We're trying for perfection here, we're not trying for expediency. And you can look at this wing, you can, you can see the dry spots, usually they're right around the edges. And you can look right down the wing and you can see all the dry spots. See right about at every rib station? Pretty much can see it at every rib station here. On the cap strips you can see the dry spots. But what this is telling me is that I have that absolute minimum thickness. See up around here there's some dry spots too. If I had more than this, if this was bright and shiny right now, if this whole thing was bright and shiny, then I'd be real nervous thinking, well, maybe I have a whole extra coat of silver on it. But because I know I have the minimum amount on there, I know I don't have any extra, especially over the rib caps and especially over each one of these little rib areas, I don't want to have one drop of silver that I don't need on here. So what's appropriate here, because we're in this rainy, the rainy season, I'll get out my M600 and spend the rest of this night prepping this and staging it, try to get it all sanded out and ready for, so when we do get a sunny day or we do get a decent day, that we're able to spray this silver and get that final coat of silver on there. I've tried a lot of different uh, choices. What I've tried to do in the past is use 600 and whatever, 1,000 grit or whatever, but 1200 is always the material of choice when you want to do the final sand out. 
Had a now it does take a little extra time. It's just a little time consuming to get this. But every minute you spend now in that final finish, you'll get all the high spots out that normally you wouldn't be able to get out. That is one of the steps I know a lot of people, especially guys in the club, these guys we have, they want to they wanna do everything in five minutes. Anyway, it took Buzz Perica four years to do the Nobler. It's probably going to take me a whole year to get this done. I want to show this on a close-up now. That's about it. Now you can see we still have a little spot up here. The next coat of silver will cover that little coat. That'll cover that right up in this little spot in the corner too. It's this. Worth a little extra effort. That's why I like to have these little pieces at my disposal. Because if this paint was not coming off as quickly as I'd like, and especially when I get over to do the mainframe at a wing, I don't want this to be, you know, too labor intensive anyway. And what the silver is helping me do is identify every little bad spot here. Every little spot that needs a little more attention. Right at the root here where we have the double tissue, you can see the joint where it starts. And this is an area where we're going to spend a little bit of extra time. Anywhere you have a little joint from extra silk span layers or little imperfections you're trying to get rid of, this is, this is the step that, and you can look down a flap and see some of the spots, you can get a lot of these little guys out right now before you get into that final coat of silver. And especially if you're using up a rainy day that you, you basically can't do much else anyway here. Definitely not going to spray today. The trick that I know of is just keep everything soaking wet. Soaking wet. The wetter it is, and as soon as you do a little area, pick an area, you know, the size of whatever. The size of a playing card is probably about right. As soon as you get that gray goop coming up to the surface, which is what's happening right now, and boy, it never hurts if you let the dope dry an extra day or so. It'll just make this part of the job a little easier. This has been sitting over a whole weekend while we were working on that Spitfire bedroom. By the way, that Spitfire bedroom is coming out great. You can get an idea how long it takes to get down to it, and boy, you can feel it. You, you could do this in the dark if you were blind. You can even hear it. You can hear the difference. But this this is going to give us, I hope, that final, or if not, we'll sand it again. A final coat of silver that's really, really nice. Any wet sand, and the main thing is to keep it clean, keep all the residue off, especially when you're doing 1,200. Any little, any little grit you can get rid of, and just keep throwing the towel away. Keep it wet, keep it clean, and the sanding goes relatively quick. And here you can see I've already got one. And the trick is, how much do you sand off? You, well, you can't sand it all off, or you may as well not put it on. But to, to leave just that small amount to get that real, the first time you sand with 1,200 and you, you feel that with your hand, it's really, you almost, I don't know, maybe you can see a shine. Maybe you can see a little bit of a shine in it, a reflection off the light. Anyway, this is the kind of the part of the job you just can't rush. You get a flap done or so, I always take a little break or whatever. But you know this is not going to go in five minutes. Well, we finally got the flaps done and it's ready to... I'm ready. <laughs> Have another cup of coffee here before we start this wing. Now, it's always good ahead of time to just look and see where the worst spots are. In this case, it seems like they're on the sheeting rather than on the calf strips the driest spots anyway. So uh, obviously the thing we don't want to do now is go through. To reach the area, one trip would have to overcome the greatest... Anytime you're going to do any any big area, you want to get a fan blowing. And in this case, they have the fan blowing right up where my work area is here. Real important to have some ventilation. And of course, you can see I have the door wide open. You don't want to. You don't want to use anything thinner, acetone, any solvent, any degreasing agent, anything in a confined area, without real good ventilation. Boy, that's a good tip too. 
Now, sometimes I get... Again, I want to be real careful around the edges. As soon as I see any hint that I'm going through the silver, and I know the cap strips are relatively dry, so what I do is try to go out over the sheeting just a little bit. Again, it may be overkill sanding the silver off this many times, but when you want the lightweight and the finish, see if you just want the finish, it's not a problem. Decoupage the plane. Put on a gallon of clear over anything, over, over raw wood, and you'll you have that. But when you want a, a seven or an eight ounce toll finish, and it and it looks like it's got a gallon of clear on it, well, this is the only way I know to do it. In fact, if there is another way, everybody's been real good. The other people that are doing it have been real good about keeping it a secret. See, now, as soon as I see I'm going through here on an open bay, that's it. So that's about the amount of time that I normally would put into one open bay here. And then of course I'll go around to all the raw wood spots. But it feels so nice with 1200. It really feels, really feels nice. And if you tend to have problems with your hands, and my hands are always in rough shape anyway, but you can do this with rubber gloves. I just, every time I do that, I wind up, I, it's a little less comfortable for me. Keep it clean, keep it wet, keep plenty of good ventilation and be patient. Boy, as you finish up one panel, I try to go down and see if I have, see that that bay doesn't have enough taken off of it. Kind of, kind of get it even. Not real important, but that's the reason for putting on all the extra material up around all the edges of the open bays. Without that extra material by the open bays, right now you'd be sanding through every time. It's funny how much different it looks and it's that look. See, a lot of people, they, the thing that they can't get right is they sand not enough off, and of course that's the easy thing to do. But they sand too much and they're constantly going through and having all kind of problems having to touch up. If you can get a little picture in your mind and get that information off the video, then you'll be able to help somebody else work their way through the first time they do this operation. And of course the best part of all is how nice the table gets when Karen comes home and sees us sees the sheets up by the washing machine. Oh, God, you are standing silver again. And then she'll always come out with her best line of all. Phew, it stinks in here. What were you doing? Not kidding, baby. Boy, if there ever is a good feeling, it's the feeling of having this done. The last thing, I'm going to put this away. We're not going to get to do this today, the way the, the weather is out there. But again, that's one of the best tips of all. I know how many people have called me up and said, gee, I just sprayed on a coat of sand, oh, it all turned milky and white and mucky and that. And they had a whole day of sanding. And in this case, this was a whole day of sanding. But we do have it clean. And before I put it away, I'll wipe it all down with M600. Get this sheet into the wash, get another sheet. Karen looks at these sheets and she, ah, oh, God, what are you doing now? She just doesn't understand the world of model aviation. You know, when she makes one of her dolls, I don't complain that she stinks up the house with doll glue or doll CA or whatever she uses. Anyway. This is a milestone. Now we're just waiting for weather. In fact, what I'm going to do probably, uh, well, it's the end of the day today. Probably tomorrow I'll start laying out the sketches for the fuselage. That'll be uh, productive. See, I don't want to be tempted to, if if push comes to shove here, I don't want to be tempted to, oh, i got to get that coat of silver on. Gotta, I'd rather have another project now while we're waiting, and I'll hang this up by the heating vent, let it dry out for another day. Now I'll sleep well tonight knowing that's all sanded out. Just something about knowing that it's done. Anyway, clean up the shop and be all set to start tomorrow. For sure, this can go right in the laundry. Karen, I love you, but uh, you got to learn to deal with this sanding silver thing. Anyway, we're getting real good use out of the pad, but you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to use this two days in a row. That's for sure. Before I <clears throat> before I get ready to lay out a set of these drawings, 
I always use the glass top of the table. Look at the stuff coming off of here now. Especially after a couple of work sessions. Because I'm going to make a concept drawing. I always start out. And the, the dimensions to make a stunt ship are not really totally unstandard. It's not like there's one set of dimensions and if you don't exactly use this dimension, it's they're, they're pretty liberal in the dimensions. And I've been able to use all kind of different tail moment arms and nose moment arms and everything to to conceptualize the look that I'm looking for. Now in this case I only have the pictures that I've gotten so far of Miss Ashley but I've, I've got a 36 photo pack coming from Fred Cronwell. So what I'm going to do is just try to lay out a conceptualized drawing of where the moment arms are going to be, where the scoop is going to be, the canopy, the rudder. Just get a rough look at how this will look when it's in full scale. Now these are the these are the drawings that Kent Tyser made, and these are real good. These are these are a nice reference for me now. But Miss Ashley does not have a P51 scoop. It starts at the front of the wing. It's got kind of a NASCAR opening. So, but we'll keep this for reference. And because I've flown this plane, this exact plane, in fact, and built several copies of this or something very similar. I know these numbers and these aerodynamics are going to work relatively well. So before I start, I'm going to look at all of the ones that I have in my inventory here, Tsunami, Strega, and get kind of traditional dimensions. They all seem to have a traditional nose moment arm. Relatively, if you line up all of, all of the top level planes, the airfoil is not that different. They just seem to photo enlarge it up and down. Tail moment arms between 17 and 18 inches usually work well. Rudder sticking out beyond here usually is one of the other criteria I like. But again, what's going to be difficult to get exactly right is the, the scoop on Miss Ashley does start way up forward and it has kind of a NASCAR opening. But again, by having all these drawings and the, the traditional standard drawings gives us a lot of choices. We have a lot of choices now when we start to lay this out in full scale for a concept drawing. Now we also have for our reference here, this is the fuselage that Gerald Champ loaned me or we still don't know if we're going to use it for a plug eventually to make a mold from. But what it is, this, this fuselage has the, the wing mounted lower than we're going to be mounting because we don't have a dihedral. If you had an inch of dihedral you could mount the wing that low. Again though, this is a this is a real asset to have because I can use this for proportion. For instance, when laying out the rudder, things like that, I can lay the drawing up against the plug and I can see, oh yeah, a little too big, a little too small. Always a big help having this. And this is what happens when you start making a concept drawing. You lay out all the lines and things you know you're going to need, where the motor mounts are going to go. And then you start moving things. We're moving a scoop around, moving the canopy five different times. And worst of all, laying out the rudder and then laying it all on the floor and looking for well just about where would that be you know luckily the pictures we have give me enough information but you know according to this picture well what it is there's going to be a lot of taper up in the back of the fuselage that's one thing and then that point on the rudder looks like that now this has the original scoop the the modified scoop comes all the way up but to get that up in the back and that up angle and I think I need more point on a rudder. Again I just need to go back and forth on this as many times as necessary and that's why the pictures are such a big help. In the beginning of this and, and beginning toward the end of this I just wear out all the pencils have no erasers at the end of the day. Anyway it, it's just a back and forth thing and I remember doing that Spitfire or was it the Seafire rudder and making up about a hundred templates. Well, luckily this is, and I'm sure Al Rabe is a lot better at it than I am. I'm sure he would take the photo enlarger out and do his thing, but I'm doing this by eye and just going back and forth until I have something like, well, something like the proportion that I expect to have and it roughly relates to that picture that I have, the side view. Well, all the erasers are pretty well shot. Anyway, I want to just lay this out 
See, all I'm looking for here is a concept. I don't want any details or anything. Just, just that the proportion is right. It looks to me like the gear have to be a little bit longer. I want to use a typical Strega type cowling if possible. And I'm trying to blend in this scoop area. This scoop area is really critical because I only have one picture from the front of how that really looks from the side. And when we get the pictures from Fred Cromwell, we'll maybe make an adjustment to that. Getting a canopy in that it comes just forward enough of the wing. And if you look at the reel, again, the reel guy here, the canopy just comes just forward of the wing. Again, it's just compromise, one compromise after another, the rudder shape. Not sure how we have that. And that little fillet area that'll go up here, I don't even know how to sketch that in yet. But we've got a little idea what this is going to look like from a from a profile point of view, so we can start figuring out how we're going to lay this out, if we're going to use shells, no shells. And of course, as we build a fuselage, we're going to have to build the exact same fuselage in a plug to make the carbon body with. No, just as a concept drawing, looks like the gear have to be longer. Obviously, the Griffin blisters up the front have to be moved higher up. That was just sketched in. The scoop needs to go up a little bit in the back. But for a first drawing, hey, and a day that it's pouring rain. Now from this, we can make some outlines the next time we have a session and possibly look at uh, getting the proportions a little more accurate. Just looking at this, it looks like the rudder needs to be longer. The lettering further down on the rudder. More of a cutout in the back. And definitely a whole redo of those Griffin blisters. Now we'll look at this tomorrow. Now this is exactly how all the things, even the lettering, evolved uh, on some of these other Reno racers just from concept drawing to just back and forth make this bigger make that smaller this is why I wish we had Al Rabel living next door I'd tie him up down here until he got this right anyway we've got plenty of pictures to look at and we'll be trying to get these proportions a little more accurate We were doing all that fooling around, hey, it's still raining and the silver is still drying up. I guess we just can't win today. Man, today's mail from Bob Pitkin, and he's got some some really cool stuff in his catalog, you know. Send him some money and he'll send you one. Send him a pizza. Anyway, we've been buying some stuff from him, and I'm going to show the samples. But check out the catalog. It's a real nice catalog. Oh, what's this crash repair here? Uh-oh. Here's what we never like to see. The old crash repair deal. Whoops. <laughs> we know all about that. Anyway, I just ordered a, a million line ends from him. And this is, I guess he's showing his supply. Looks like he's raising kabasi or something here. Anyway, he just made me up a couple of hundred here for those... The bell crank assemblies that we're, uh, we've been using, and I need a specific, no sense even opening these up. But anyway, he sent me some samples, and I would suggest anybody that's not not interested in wrapping their own lines or some, even though we sell cable for handles, we'll give his a plug. His is good stuff. We tried it. He sent me some samples of the crimps. He's also got a couple other little items here. I'm going to look over the catalog later. 
going to try to do some barter trading here. Now I sent him some of our offset pads. These these are phenolic. And the only problem is there's no offset in them. Obviously these are made for another application. But anyway, Bob Pitkin and his lovely wife. He has the Giorgino handles. All kinds of cool stuff. Check out his catalog. I think he's going to have a website real soon, so we'll try to get that on here if we can. Project I have while we're going through this rainy spell. I got the foam cores today, and these are a very unique set for Miss Ashley, and I want to make templates, yet I don't have any templates. So what I did, and I didn't know if anybody knew this little trick, it's an old trick from, I, I guess from foam wing days, put the tape on there, and then that gives you a nice edge, just line up the core on the center line, trace around it, and we're going to clip this out on the jigsaw, this is going to be our template for laying out the fuselage and, the, and what will be the plug for the carbon fuselage. That's a good little trick when you're going to do these kind of templates. Leave a little bit of extra wood on. But what I wanted to show is when you make a template, I want to wind up with the line still on there. So what I can do now is go over to the belt sander and just take the last little bit off with the belt sander. Or if you didn't have a belt sander, a nail file. But you want to keep the whole line on. And these are going to be real handy now as I'm getting ready to start the fuselage. I'm going to need this piece. This is one of the pieces I'm going to need. I'm also going to need uh, the template for the cowling, the angle of the cowling. I want to make sure I'm going to put the motor in place. and these, All these little detailed things I can do while I'm waiting for this weather to clear up. Nice nail files with the Bud McKnight sanding sticks, whatever you want to call them, to dress the edges off. And this will be real handy to have when we do a, a final drawing of this fuselage concept. We start laying in the part shapes and things like that. Now that we have a little concept idea of what this is going to look like when we're finished. Well, the, real, the weatherman really wasn't kidding again. Another super wet, soggy day. I guess we'll work on some more drawings. What I've done is get another picture to side view. I have the original picture that I made yesterday with, oh, let's see, let's see if I can show this up, with like what I'll call a layover. What it'll allow me to do, see I have the original drawing under there and it's tracing right on top and now what it's allowing me to do for instance after looking at the picture of the the NASCAR type of scoop I've moved the scoop moved the gear down and back enlarged the rudder changed the shape a little bit and I can look at definitely going to change that nose section but by doing a little bit of this playing around playing around playing around each time I make a drawing, and I may make two or three of these today, obviously I'll do it off camera, but I want to get, you know, unless you have a photo enlarger, and unless there's some way you can do this, and obviously what you'd need is a, an accurate side view, but, but what I do is I do it from the mind's eye. I just keep sketching and changing. You can see I moved the gear back a little. I moved that scoop. I'm going to change the canopy, change the height of the canopy. And when I'm... And, I don't care, actually with this thing, I don't care if it takes all day and I, you know, I have to work on this tomorrow. Before I can start the fuselage, I need a set of accurate drawings. It sure looks like this wing is never going to get painted at the rate we're going, but anyway, we're going to forge forward with some drawings today. Maybe finalize the drawing and then start on the mechanical part of it, laying in the formers and things like that. Today's 
amazing is when you start sketching in how very little it takes and I'm looking at the drawing here it doesn't take much for instance just moving the canopy up even a small amount even a an inch or so changes the whole look at a plane so I like to sketch with pencils and erasers as much as possible there's certain things that can't change the wing location the location of the motor the location of the tail those are things I want to leave as is but the rest of this what I call the cosmetic stuff just by moving the canopy forward and adding some taper little things like that moving the gear back moving the scoop you can change the whole look at a plane and what I do is just just compare by actually by eye now the thing I'm trying to work in is this little tail fillet I don't know how we're going to, or even if we're going to be able to portray this, but this should get sketched in there. Just to get an idea where this would wind up. See, because you're not making a scale. The problem with all of this is you're not making a scale model. It'd be easy if you were making a scale model. You just photo enlarge everything. But it's that in, called interpolation where you have to kind of fake it. It's got to look longer than it is, look shorter. And that that piece around the tail that might be a difficult thing to model. I don't know. We're gonna we're certainly gonna find out. Each time we up upgrade the drawing or change it, then we work off drawing two. We may do ten drawings. I don't know before we get one that we're real happy with. But each time, it'll get a little bit more in proportion to what I'm looking for. A lot of people think you just sit down at a table and doom 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 and there's the Nobler or the Thunderbird baloney. I'll bet you anybody that's done this will tell you that this is very labor intensive and you just have to keep going. At least I do anyway. Unless you're a professional artist and I'm certainly not. You just need to go keep going back and forth, back and forth. Now what I'm doing, I'm overlaying this, my sketch, right over Kent Tyser's sketch. And Kent, of course, has worked up a really nice side view here. Let's get him even. Let's see what it looks like when we line it up. Well, Kent's plane is a little bit longer, and that's because he has a little bit longer tail moment arm. His scoop is a little bit bigger, and I thought when I flew the plane I'd like to make that scoop a little smaller, but you can see how close we got this. And I told him, hey, I didn't like the canopy being so big, and look, now without ever doing this, I've... And the rudder shape, we're almost at exactly the same height. His rudder is wider. And I may make mine a little wider yet. I'm not sure. That rudder is going to... If anybody's ever watched the, the Seafire drawing when I was making a rudder template and a shorter nose moment arm here. So we just have a little bit shorter, a little bit smaller plane. And because we're using the smaller of the two airfoils, you can see how close they are. They're not, not a whole lot different when you compare them. In fact, they're almost identical. Wheels almost are in exactly the same position. So this is how, by doing interpolation, you can lay this now, if you wanted to, you could lay this on top of any plane, just to compare where it was and what you were looking at, and you can see how long they are, how short they are. A layover is a nice way, if you're going to design your own plane, you say, well, here's what I like, and here's what I do. Oh, whoops. Let me make my plane a little longer. Let me make it a little shorter. Interpolation is a nice thing. It's a nice option. I'm always amazed at how similar all these wing ribs are. Now, even this one has that raybized airfoil. It's not a whole lot different. You can see the big one inside the little one. Anyway, always good to double check. I can do my layover right over, and this is really a good trick. Since I love the nose section on the Sea Fire, I can lay this nose section over, and I know I have the mold for this part. Well, pretty easy here. I can trace that in right now. And I can live with that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start getting some colored paper and making up some different rudders. Now, see, I've got the proportion. Well, I could go a little bigger. The proportion is almost right, but I'm really not totally crazy about the rudder yet. So I'm going to make up some paper doll rudders, and that's a good, that's a very easy way to do it. By the way, anytime you do this, just line up the wing. If you want to compare a Nobler to a T-Bird or any combination. Once you have that comparison you can see how similar the gear locations are. Again, and if you like a certain side view, this by laying, doing a layover 
It allows you to do a lot of stuff with a very little bit of work. Okay, drawing number three. We finally got something like what I want for a rudder design. I finally have the proportion to this that I'm happy with and a canopy and scoop proportion. The only thing left is I'm not real happy with the way this part worked out. But I'm going to sketch this out and that's going to be the end of this today is I'm going to finally hopefully wind up with a number three concept sketch and from that I'm going to be able to draw in all the formers. In other words I'll leave this this way and take the final one, trace that out which will be number four and then mark where the fuselage side goes and where the tune pipe goes and where the header goes and we'll lay all that separately. That'll be a job for another day. Now for all the work I've put into these drawings, <laughs> a lot of hours, at least I've got the satisfaction of knowing that I've I've got the final one here. I can even lay the wing in place here and look at it. I'm very close to having what I want and I'm ready for the final, the actual drafting drawing when that's an appropriate day. Again, we are just buried with shop projects, so we're going to let this sit right now. The next step, of course, is to get what I hope will be a final or next to final coat of silver on the wing and then make a firm drafting drawing from this from which I can cut templates and parts. So I hope you got a good idea from this and you can put this to some use in your building program anyway. Doing these layovers really gives you a lot of choices and in this case I could, I, in theory, I could lay the wing right in place here and stand this up and get some idea of what this looked like in three dimensions. But I just have never found a better way than just doing it over and over and over and over. Unless, of course, you are an extremely talented artist, or you're Al Rabe, one or the other, or you have a photo enlarger. At the end of the tape, and I just wanted to, uh, you know, hope everybody's going to pick up some information. This, we're in the middle of making up a whole bunch more molded parts. Now, with a dedicated part of the shop, able to make tune pipes relatively easily. And of course, this is the look we're really looking for. That scoop, that is, when that's done right. If I can get it right, boy, I'll be real happy with that. I'll close off this tape with a little, little show of what we've got done up in a Spitfire bedroom here. We got a World War II suitcase full of memorabilia, hat from Duxford, some 50 millimeter ammo cartridges, a wallet by Pete, everything that relates to some helmets some aviation books that relate to Spitfires, some of our concourse awards, nice picture of a Merlin there, some of our frame pictures, some of the pictures that we're still going to frame, the concourse clock award, And three of the most uh, labor-intensive planes that I've ever made, anyway. Anyway, we hope to see you on the next tape. And we're actually going to have guests in this bedroom by the next time we make a tape. Maybe we'll make them sleep on the cot. And we're going to write a little blurb for Stunt News about our what now is, I hope, a very unique thing, the Spitfire bedroom. And boy, we just have more little memorabilia up here. What a great little thing this has turned out to be, the little Spitfire from Sleepy. Some of the Nats trophies, some of the Hampton trophies. Our mili supposedly military couch. And soon, hope hopefully on the next couple of videos, George is going to paint this ceiling or this area here with a World War II scene oil painted by hand. A little bulletin board with all the little ration coupons and things. And the newspaper from the day I was born, August the 16th, 1945. Can you imagine? 
and some of our other great little memorabilia that people have sent us over the years. This room has been a lot of fun to work on. I just don't know how much more fun you, you ever could have, no matter what you did with your life, if you were the king of Egypt or something. I don't know, but I've certainly had fun. Certainly had a great time building these planes. Now that they're on permanent display, whoever sleeps in this room will get to uh, hug and kiss him at night. Or whatever, a great chapter in, in my modeling career anyway, my modeling life. Let's hope the house doesn't burn down. <laughs> See you on the next tape. Well, one thing I certainly get a lot of enjoyment out of having just a great collection of these books. Walkers are invading us here. Look at this. Now, how would you like to be flying? And have a look at his B-17. Check this out. Yeah, as Mike flies by. He flew over the field while I was flying before. Not everybody has this lovely experience. Different stinger arrangements, try different cone angles. We've made several mandrels that with with mediocre success. But we finally come upon what I hope is going to be the ultimate mandrel. And this is a solid piece of Teflon. TFE it's called. It's solid Teflon. And it's the next step in our program. We've been releasing these shells. These shells release almost automatically, in fact. They come right off of here. And the reason I wanted to have a little bit of a curve in it so it could go up over the hump and a wing without having a pipe hang out. Nothing looks uglier than a, the pipe hanging out like a you know, a foot or something sticking out of the plane. Anyway, we've been real lucky with the shells, we've been real lucky with the baffles. But the next step on this, and I don't know if we're going to get to do this today, tomorrow, or when, is we want to make a female mold for this part so that we can compress this. Once this is laid up on the mandrel, we can compress it into a rubber sleeve that'll squeeze out all the extra resin. Right now, what I've been doing, and it's very labor intensive, is taking each pipe and basically sanding it by hand or by machine and it takes quite a bit of time to do it. What we have though is we're building, and, and this is the reason I wanted to document little parts of this. We're building up toward what we hope is going to be a final design and the final tooling will be really, really nice so that the parts will all come out ultra light, strong, and really um, a level of workmanship that, that sets the standard in this, in this hobby, I hope. Anyway, so far these are coming out nice. They've all tested well. I've only had one where it had a, a significant leak in it, and it was where I had sanded it real close by the pressure fitting. Other than that, even the, op even the empty ones, when these are all put together, they're about 40 grams. That's a significant saving over other pipes. So for somebody who's got a problem with the bottom of the plane being heavy, these will be a nice little touch. But again, the part of this, and I wanted to put at least one of these on the tape, of hand finishing one of these is extremely labor intensive. And that's why we're going to try making the compression mold up, just as a way of saving labor. And also, if you look at the, when these come off the sleeve, you can see they're very pimply and rough, and there's all little, these mountain tops, this pipe is only as strong as it is in the bottom of the valley. So anything that sticks up above the valley, is just adding weight and not adding any strength at all. And that's what we're trying to eliminate with this step. A couple of things. If you're going to do any serious sanding on any carbon part, you really want to have a real good Wilson mask. You also want to have some kind of a vacuum removal system because it's really this fine microscopic dirt. This gets in your lungs. Really not a good idea. 
Anyway, I start with the extra photoresin that's on there, and this is just the reason we want to have that compression mold.